thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning instead of sleeping. Uh, you don't need sleep. My, uh, my kids are uh, 15 and 17, and they're still sleeping. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> anyways, can you see in the back? Are you guys okay back there? Because I don't want you to, you know, get bored or anything. If you get bored, <laughs> just raise your hand and say I'm bored, okay? Because this is not a boring subject. This is antimatter. This is one of the coolest things there is. And uh, you guys okay back there? You gonna be all right? All right. Can you, can you see? All right. And if you get bored, let me know. And you too. You get you get bored, let me know. Okay. Okay. So what's going to happen today is um, we're going to talk about um, antimatter in two sessions. This morning we're going to talk till about 9:50 on that clock right there, and then. Um, you're going to take a break, get a soda, deal with bathroom if you got to do that, and then uh, <clears throat> and then we're going to go on from there until uh, until left. So, so you will have a break um, if you're getting sick of listening to this stuff. It'll be about 9:50. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have some props here, various things to play with. We'll we'll, we'll get to that um, a little bit later in the lecture. And uh, if this gets too loud, just raise your hand and say you're too loud. And, uh, something about it. I think, I think it was too, too loud earlier. Um, and uh, today, we're going to be uh, not very heavy on equations. We're going to do one equation for two hours. And uh, we're going to talk about physics in the way that physics, I think, should be talked about, and that's concepts, mostly. And we'll talk about one equation, okay, which is a very important one, but we're not going to dwell on This is not going to be a very math-heavy kind of lecture. Okay? So um, I used to have a... I didn't hurt anybody. So we'll try that again. If it, if it just doesn't work, we'll just get rid of it. Uh, I don't know a collar. It's like, well. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about um, antimatter, uh, what it is, where it is, and who cares. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll just talk about one equation, E is equal to mc squared, something you've seen uh, lots of places. I haven't done any... Uh, Google searches for e equals mc squared, or ask anybody on YouTube, but it's probably out there. Um, now, you guys have probably read science fiction, some of you, any of you? So in science fiction, uh, you, you've read about antimatter, you've thought about it a little bit, perhaps. Um, you know some of the properties of it conceptually, and, and some of this is a review. Um, so let me just, just say a few of the basic properties from a physics perspective, and then we'll go into what some of those uh, implications are of these properties of antimatter. So antimatter is, in many respects, a mirror a mirror copy of normal matter. It's it's, uh, in, uh, it's almost identical to matter. The mass of an of an antiparticle is equal to the mass of a particle. So what that means is that if you had a proton and were to weigh that proton, and you had an antiproton and weigh the antiproton, the mass of those two would be very similar. Would be would be identical. Theoretically, we think they're identical. Experimentally, we have tested the mass of particles and antiparticles. We've developed ways to, to uh, uh, look for the difference between the mass of particles and antiparticles. And we've done experiments where we've looked, measured the difference between the mass of a particle and the mass of an antiparticle to one part in 10 to the 20th. That's one of the most precise measurements of physics, actually, that um, we've taken a particle called a kaon, which we'll talk about after, after the break and an anti kaon and we've measured very precisely the, uh, the mass between those, those two particles. And with, um, so the difference would be 0.00000000, um, <coughs> uh, 19 zeros and then one um, uh, percent. So it's a very, very, very tiny difference. So experimentally, we've tested the mass of a particle and an antiparticle and they're very close. You've had a lecture about the Tevatron Collider. You've heard about that already? That's our principal tool here, our principal research tool. We collide protons and antiprotons together, and those protons and antiprotons travel in the same magnet. They're traveling in the same ring of magnets. If the mass of an antiproton were different significantly from the mass of a proton, that wouldn't work, because in order for the particles to have the same circular radius inside that path of magnets, they have to be the same mass. So 
we use the fact the masses are identical <coughs> between particles and antiparticles to, in fact, make our, our main research tool here, and that's to collide protons and antiprotons together. Another property of antimatter is that the electric charge, if it has it, of an antiparticle is the opposite of the, uh, the matter particle. So uh, antiproton has a negative charge. The proton, of course, has positive charge. An anti-electron, which we call a positron, has a positive charge compared to the negative charge of an electron. Now this leads to this kind of amazing phenomenon which you probably have read about, and that's annihilation. If you have, uh, and again, that's our, our principal research tool here at Fermilab is that we annihilate matter and antimatter. We take protons and antiprotons and we smack them head on, and that annihilates into a pure energy state, and then that energy can then decay into or convert into top quarks uh, bottom quarks, all sorts of jazz that's created in that collision. New particles can be created, which we can study. That's our main deal here at Fermilab, is that we um, <coughs> use matter-antimatter collisions to make new particles. Now, what that means is that um, it would make, for example, an unbelievably powerful weapon if you were to have a, uh, a gram of antimatter and were to throw it at someone, it would be bad. Um, it would be really bad. It would make it, you know, a, a crater as big as Chicago if you were to have a, a gram of antimatter come in and smack into the earth. If you were to um, encounter your anti-self, if you were to be on a planet that was made out of antimatter, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and you were to um, shake hands with your anti-self, it'd make a huge dent in that planet. So it's a, it's a good thing you don't run into your anti-self um, too frequently. So. What would it look like? Let's think about a minute about what it would, if you were to run into your anti-cell, what would that look like? So let's think about, let's, let's think about stuff we know. Let's think about atoms. We know about atoms. Atoms are um, <clears throat> electrons swarming around a core of nuclear matter made out of protons and neutrons. So an atom is protons and neutrons in the center, as you all know. There's this uh, beehive of electrons that, uh, come to you in a second, that, 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 that orbit that atom. And that's, and that's how we view, that's our image of an atom. Yes, sir? Well, with the, how would your anti-self look like? Wouldn't they look like basically exactly the same? Next unless slide. There's an, unless there's such thing as an anti-proton? Keep that thought, because we're going to talk about exactly that on the next slide. OK. So uh, an anti-atom, just following your line of reasoning, is positrons anti-electrons swarming around an anti-nucleus made out of anti-protons and anti-neutrons. So an anti-atom would be uh, negative charges in the center and positive charges in, around the outside. Now that, of course, um, leads to great minds think alike. Question, what would an antimatter world look like? Your question. Okay. So we see atoms by the light emitted between um, by the electrons swarming around the uh, atomic nucleus. So that's how, that's where light comes from. The, um, the light, when we think of an atom now, there's electrons around that. And then there's shells of electrons. A photon, as you've mentioned, is, originates from an electron transitioning from one shell to the next. And then that photon um, comes out, and we observe that. The, in your physics class, perhaps, you really should see this. In, this in, in your physics class, you may have seen, you've talked about the force between two charged particles. Anybody want to tell me what that is? Coulomb's law? Anybody know what that is? They Coulomb's law? Over R squared. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, say again? They over R squared. One charge times the other charge divided by r squared, then times some number we don't particularly care about, we'll call that k. Um, that's the force between two charged particles. Okay, Coulomb's law goes as a square. So in the case of matter, positive nucleus, and negative electrons, you have an attractive force. In the case of anti-atoms, you have a negative nucleus, positive electrons, attractive force. The force, in fact, is the same if the masses, we've said the masses are the same, the charges are the same, but just opposite. They're still, the product is still negative in both cases. 
So what happens, as you have predicted, is that the forces inside of an anti-atom are identical to the forces inside of a normal atom. So the photons, the photon transitions in an atom are the same. So <clears throat> the light that's produced is the same. So if you were to encounter your anti-self in an anti-world, you'd have a brown jacket and a white shirt, blue jeans. You would look exactly the same. That kind of stinks because you wouldn't know whether the person you're about to shake hands with is antimatter or not until you shook hands and then you made a huge step in the planet. And then that's kind of bad at that point. So it's interesting that antimatter would look exactly the same. So, um, it, so later in, in the next lecture, for your own safety, we're going to talk about ways to discriminate matter from antimatter. So in case you're in that situation, you'll now have, have a trick. Okay. So, E is equal to mc squared. Heard of that? Um, this is uh, uh, an equation written, written by uh, who? Einstein. Einstein, not the bagel guy, the other guy. Um, in 1905, in 1905, uh, Einstein was um, in his 20s, and he had a day job. He worked during the day. And at night, he thought about physics. And in 1905, he wrote four papers uh, after work that, that, that created modern physics. He invented modern physics. And the mathematics that he used, um, are you guys in Algebra 2 yet? Who's in Algebra 2? Anybody? Calculus Algebra 2. OK. Trick? Calculus, anybody? Right. So, so, so Einstein, his four papers that changed the world, you got most. You could do most of it with algebra two, okay. So, so physics, his 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 ideas that changed the world were concepts about the physical world, which then you develop with math. The math does not have to be very sophisticated. People think about Einstein as this kind of freaky guy with his heavy duty math, and that's true for general relativity. But the the the, the research that he did in 1905, including e equals mc squared. All that math you guys could do. In fact, we'll give you a homework exercise to derive special relativity. You've probably heard about it already, I think, haven't you? Yeah? Yes, no? So, <clears throat> what does it mean? And it turns out this is very important for antimatter. What it means, as we've talked about a little bit before at Fermilab here, is that matter and energy can flow freely into each other through, um, uh, through the vehicle of antimatter. So, C squared is the speed of light squared, as you've heard, but it's just a number. It's a big number. Since it's the square of a big number, it's a big number. So the message of what this <coughs> equation is saying is that E is equal to, is equal to mass. This was a total, um, this was a total headbanger in the early 1900s because the concept of energy was this, this softball has potential energy, yes? Yeah. I drop it, it has kinetic energy when it hits the floor, and the potential energy changes into kinetic energy. And we were, you know, in physics you learn about the relationship between potential energy and kinetic energy. You, you think about an object having energy, but you never think about that the energy of the object coming from the mass or the mass being changed into energy. This was a totally foreign concept. In, uh, in the early 1900s. And that's what this equation means, actually, is that <clears throat> there's an equivalence between energy and mass so that the mass of an object can flow into its kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy can flow into the mass of the object. This was an amazing notion. Um, <clears throat> there are some rules about E is equal to mc squared, which we'll talk about. One is that uh, there's no free lunch. Maybe your parents have been told, telling you that for some time now. Um, and what that means is that uh, even though this amazing thing can occur, that mass can turn into energy and energy can turn into mass, it has to be, the mass energy has to be conserved. You can't create energy out of nothing. You can't create mass out of nothing. It's remarkable that you can turn mass into energy and likewise the reverse, but you can't create no, um, energy out of nothing. Symmetry, the matter, uh, antimatter balance is required to actually get this reaction to go, you have to have an equal amount of matter and antimatter, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. <clears throat> the density is enormous. 
And that comes from the fact that c squared is an enormous number. The amount of energy that you get from a gram of mass times c squared, which is a gargantuan number, means that you get an enormous amount of energy, tremendous amount of energy, much more than conventional sources of, um, of, uh, of energy on our planet. The, um, <coughs> When you have matter and antimatter colliding and combining, <clears throat> that's a 100% conversion of mass into energy. Um, let's think of for a minute about what's the most efficient, um, the most energetic object in our normal lives. When, when you think about incredible sources of energy, uh, on the, on the Earth or the solar system, you think about the sun. The sun's a tremendously uh, energetic source of energy. <clears throat> it turns out there's a nuclear fusion reaction <laughs> going on inside the sun. The efficiency of turning energy into mass for the sun is 0.7%, less than 1%. Uh, so if, if the sun burns for 4 billion years and you were to weigh it, it would weigh 0.7% less than when it began. So 0.7% of its mass goes into energy. So that's the, the, the sun is 1% is efficient in converting mass into energy. So imagine what it would happen if you had 100% efficiency of converting mass into energy. Um, then you'd have this source, which is 100 times more energetic than the sun. And then, so that's what's attractive about antimatter and interesting about it. Let me show you some examples of matter being turned into, uh, excuse me, energy being turned into matter. So what this is is a photograph. This is an ancient uh, bubble chamber photograph, which we'll talk about a little bit later, about what a bubble chamber is. What's this, what this is a picture of are high energy protons coming in from the left into a vessel of liquid hydrogen, um, something you don't play with in your garage. Um, and a case, so most of the time, the protons zip through this vessel of liquid hydrogen, minding their own business, and then they leave. And occasionally what happens is that one of those protons it smashes into the nucleus of the hydrogen or um, a proton. And then what happens in that collision is that this proton which comes in, which is a single particle, smacks into another proton, which is a single particle. And there's 25 new particles created. So the energy of this collision is being used to make matter and antimatter particles. So in fact, if, if we count them up, there's just as many matter and antimatter particles. If there's 10 particles created, there's 10 antimatter particles created, because we have to have the charge balance like we talked about earlier in the earlier today. So this is a photograph of E is equal to mc squared. Of the en kinetic energy of this proton being converted into the mass of the particle. Ah, all right. All right, sorry. If anybody was asleep, there's not, not, not true now. All right. OK, sorry about that. It's twice now. Someone keep track. You know what I'm going to do? I just, I'm going to have to swallow it. Um, the, uh, I'm going to try it without it, just because I don't have a collar. And if, I, and if you can't hear me, then just do this, OK? OK, now, or even better, if you can't hear me, then come closer to the front. <clears throat> so you've seen a picture of this place. It's too bad it doesn't look like that now, since it's wintertime. Fermilab. We have matter and antimatter rotating in counterclockwise and clockwise directions. We smack them head on. We make um, top quarks and anti-top quarks. This is kind of a cruddy slide, but I'm going to show it anyways. The content is great, but the quality of the slide is not good. So you've heard about this already. This is another example of energy being turned into mass. Um, so what's happening here, as you know, is we have antiprotons cruising in one direction, smacking head on the protons into another. The energy of the protons, in the case of the Tevatron, the energy of each proton is about 1,000 times its mass. The energy is so high of the proton that from the perspective of E is equal to mc squared, the amount of energy is 1,000 times the rest mass of a proton. That's how energetic it is. And that energy, that kinetic energy, is converted into a top quark and an anti-top quark in this collision. Um, so the energy of this proton, and where that, let's think about where that energy came from. The energy of the proton came from 
the accelerator. The accelerator is connected to Commonwealth Edison. We have power poles that come into the site, those big monster power poles. So electricity on the power poles drives the accelerator, the, which makes kinetic energy of the protons, which makes top quarks and anti-top quarks. So these top quarks and anti-top quarks came from your ele same electric bill that your parents have. So the electricity from Commonwealth Edison was turned into matter and antimatter, in this case a rather dramatic form of top quarks and anti-top quarks, which were first discovered here in 1995 in your backyard. 1995 was 12 years ago. What, what were you guys doing 12 years ago? Barney? Were you watching Barney? Did you ever watch Barney? Did you ever have been Barney? Okay. So it's um, 1995, when you guys were young and, you know, hanging out with, playing with your friends, we discovered top quarks and anti-top quarks here at Fermilab. We created them using matter and antimatter. Um, now the top quark, of course, is um, one of the many uh, things in particle physics which we don't understand <coughs> is the fact that the top quark is extremely massive. And I think you know that we have six quarks that we uh, believe exist, two of which have been discovered here at Fermilab. Um, the totally surprising thing about a top quark is the mass of a top quark is equal to the mass of a gold atom. It's 181 times the mass of a proton. That's why we had to take all that energy, all that kinetic energy was required to come together and make a uh, top quark and an anti-top quark. And we have absolutely no idea why the top quark is as heavy as it is, or in fact, even weirder, why it's so different from its five cousins. So. This is, uh, you have six quarks, and the quarks that make up our normal life are down here, these little puny guys in mass. And then we have this bizarre spectrum of mass, which we have no idea why that is. Um, we, we have some hints, which I'll talk about in the next, next lecture, what's going on, but that's an interesting fact that um, we uh, really don't have a clue about. Um, I mentioned um, that Antimatter and matter combining together is the most efficient way of converting uh, uh, to creating energy. And this, is, this fact has not escaped the notice of NASA. Um, and NASA is in the business of sending spacecraft uh, everywhere, and sometimes even people on them. And so there's lots of programs. NASA has a lot of interest in, in antimatter propulsion. There's uh, websites that you can Google and find. Um, if, you, if you're interested in uh, aeronautic propulsion, there's uh, you can go to Penn State and um, uh, go to their program, learn about uh, uh, aeronautic propulsion. Um, one of the, uh, but uh, that's all far in the future. How we get to, let's think about for a minute how we get into space now. Um, and uh, so how we get into space now is uh, this, has anybody ever seen a shuttle launch in, in this? Yeah, it's either great. And, and sometimes you can't, you go down to Florida, you, you never can time it right, because they they're always delayed for some reason. Um, but I'd love, love to do it sometime. But you, you've seen the shuttle launch on TV, and it's an amazing thing. It's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of uh, flash and excitement to see this thing go off. So what's going on here? So what's going on here is that you have a spaceship strapped down to this massive uh, gas tank. And the, why we do that is because um, the efficiency of our converting mass into energy by burning kerosene is very, very, very low, or by burning even liquid hydrogen and oxygen in the case of, of, of the shuttle is very, very low. The, the sun, I mentioned, has a 1% efficiency of converting mass into energy, which is super high even compared to this. This is the efficiency of us turning mass into energy by burning something, like, like a rocket fuel, is about, it's about 10 to the minus 6, one part in a million. So getting into space is hard because you have to, most of the fuel is used to lift the fuel because you have to take this fuel with you and, it, and it's inefficient and it's on your back and you have to, you know, and you have to carry all that stuff up there with you. Um, so that's one of the big burdens of, um, of space flight, and the only reason why we can even get into space is we have this stage program of stage one, stage two, stage you, you, when, when you, if you're, if, you, if you're into space flight, you studied it, 
you know that the, the most important thing is to drop weight as quickly as possible when you're going off into space. So you're going off into space, you said, it's the, the second you don't need something, you let go of it because it's just, you know, it's just hanging on your back. And you're trying to get speed. You've got to get, <clears throat> you've got to get up to 11,000 miles per hour to, to escape the Earth's gravity. That's a little hard to do if you've got your little brother hanging on your back. So you have to just shed weight as quickly as possible. So the advantage of antimatter fuel is that to carry to launch the shuttle into orbit <clears throat> would take a few milligrams of antimatter fuel. So it's incredibly efficient. Um, and it's attractive for that reason to NASA, um, that it's, it's in some sense it's perfect fuel. So um, <clears throat> where is the antimatter? Um, and uh, we talked about the unfortunate instance you were to run into your anti-cell. Um, or if any of us would run into our anti-cell. Good thing that hasn't happened. So where is it? There's tiny amounts that are in laboratories. I mentioned that we discovered the top fork here at Fermilab. We did that by making um, top forks and anti-top forks. We took energy and made, took that energy from E equals MC squared and made top forks and anti-top forks. So we make tiny amounts of antimatter in our laboratories out of energy. That's how we do it. Um, what about the natural world? Um, what, uh, what about the moon? Is the moon made out of antimatter? And this was something people were worried about in, 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 in the 1950s and 60s when there was discussion of sending an astronaut to the moon. And that, you know, these guys, these, these, these test pilots are pretty, you know, they're kind of pumped up guys, but, but, but even, they, even they were a little worried about, you know, vaporizing the flash of light if they were to step onto the moon. So they were a little concerned about it. Um, so, <clears throat> so, you, so you have to ask yourself, um, is the moon made out of antimatter? And we did a test, we sent a piece of matter from the Earth, it was called Neil Armstrong, and we sent it to the moon. <laughs> and and, and he, he jumped off that ladder and he stepped down and he did not turn into a, a flash of light, so we would have seen that with a telescope. Um, and he survived his small step onto the moon. So we know the moon is not made out of antimatter because we sent a test piece of matter there. Okay. And, uh, and you can, and we know that this was an American adventure, totally American adventure, because we brought our first SUV to the moon. We went too. We had a car. We brought a car in a garage. It was always incredibly exciting, actually. Um, so, uh, what about elsewhere in the universe? Um, antimatter. The moon's not there. Um, let's see. What about the sun? Is the sun made out of antimatter? How do we know that the sun's not made out of antimatter? Because we, you know, we had this discussion about photons. The sun is the source of photons. And we know that photons and antiphotons are the same. There's no difference. So what about the sun? Who's got an argument to tell me that the sun is made out of matter and not antimatter? Go. Does the sun like shed a lot of its mass and like and, and like uh, what is it called? Solar flares and stuff. Right. Solar wind, yes. <coughs> Anybody ever seen the aurora borealis, northern lights? Anybody ever see that? Ever go up to Saskatchewan, something like that, way, way north? So what's going on in northern lights? Do you know what's happening in northern lights? What's happening in northern lights is that the sun is shedding protons, actually, or particles at least. They're flying through space, bouncing off magnetic <coughs> fields. They hit the Earth, top of the Earth's atmosphere, which is nitrogen and oxygen. The protons hit the, the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen and cause the nitrogen and oxygen to fluoresce. And you get these beautiful green, yellows, reds, that kind of thing. Now, if those were antiprotons that hit the top of the atmosphere instead of protons, then the Earth's surface would be baked to a crackly crisp with gamma rays from that matter-antimatter annihilation at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. So the fact that we're not baked to a crackly crisp with, 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 with hard um, gamma rays means that the particles that hit the Earth's atmosphere are matter, protons, in fact. So what about elsewhere? In our solar system, what do, what do we know about the other planets? I'm going to give somebody else a chance. I'm going to come back to you. All right. What about the other planets? What about Jupiter? 
Anybody know about Jupiter? Hmm? That's Saturn. But Jupiter has Jupiter, Jupiter has two. Jupiter has Jupiter has three something. But you know, we just talked we just talked about the Northern Lights. That the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a telescope, one of our most powerful telescope, has seen Northern Lights on Jupiter. You know, the the same thing about the shimmering in, in on the Earth that we can point a telescope at other planets that have a gaseous atmosphere like Jupiter. And we see northern lights there, and then the light that comes off the northern lights there is um, uh, consistent with northern light lights and not gamma rays. So that we know that the, that we know that the protons, the particles that hit the Earth are protons. Those same particles hit Jupiter and make the same kind of light, so Jupiter's made out of matter. We've looked at other planets in the same way. We've looked throughout our universe and have looked for the kind of hard radiation that you would get by uh, electrons and positrons finding each other and annihilating and making hard gamma rays. We looked throughout the entire, we looked throughout our galaxy. We looked at even colliding galaxies, and we don't see this anywhere. We don't see any evidence in our gap in our universe of large amounts of matter and antimatter annihilating, which is kind of surprising. Um, in 1987, uh, a supernovae went off in our galaxy. And it's a good thing we weren't close, because then you guys wouldn't, wouldn't be here. Um, a supernovae goes off about once every 100 years per galaxy. So we know that because we look at 100 galaxies out in space, we see a supernovae go off once a year and those things. In our own galaxy, in 1987, when I was in graduate school, um, a supernovae went off. And this was an incredibly exciting event because at the time we had just put a detector underground in a salt mine in Cleveland to look for neutrinos. And um, it turns out we weren't looking for supernovae, but we are looking for something else. But what was interesting is that what's interesting about neutrinos in contrast to photons is, is that neutrinos are not the same as antineutrinos. Photons are the same as antiphotons. So <clears throat> when we heard this thing went off, we rushed and looked at our data and looked to see if we observed anti-neutrinos from the supernovae. And, we, and it turns out we didn't. So but let's, let's, let's think a little bit about supernova. I got a, a slightly ahead of myself. When a supernova goes off, when it blows off, you think of it, I'm sure, in your mind, when you think about a supernova, oh my gosh, there's this bright flash of light. There's a lot of matter that's spread all over, makes a huge mess. But most of the energy in a supernova occurs in neutrinos. A supernova is, is actually a neutrino flash with a tiny amount of uh, electromagnetic energy thrown in there, just for a show. And that 99% 90, of the energy is carried away by neutrinos in, this, in the supernova <coughs> when, when the core collapses in the star. And the rest is just for show. So. And as, as I mentioned, we didn't see any anti-neutrinos, so it was the first evidence in our galaxy of getting particles that we, from, that we were sure from another star. That, because we, we saw the flash of light, supernovae, that's supernovae. We looked in our detector, and at the same time it said, yes, we got a blast of particles from this uh, at the same time as the light flash. So we know that they're uh, matter neutrinos and not antimatter neutrinos, so we know that that star that went off in our galaxy very far away was matter. Go. Aren't neutrinos neutral? They are. Well, if they're neutral, they, can they really have an opposite? Because what's opposite to something that's neutral? So what about atoms? We talked about atoms before, right? Yeah. Atoms are neutral. But they consist of particles that aren't neutral. Yes. As far as we know, as far as we know, anything such as an anti-neutron, is there? There is, there is something such as an anti-neutron, which we'll talk about. Neutrons are made out of quarks. Quarks have electric charges. Anti-neutrons can exist just like an anti-atom can exist. Anti-atoms are combinations of anti-protons and anti-electrons. Anti-neutrons are combinations of anti-quarks, where it turns out that the sum of charges is zero. We don't know really much about neutrinos. Could be that there's substructure in them. We just don't know. Um, we'll talk about that in the next lecture, actually. But it is possible to construct <coughs> neutral objects 
outer charge objects that are neutral. That's obvious. And that's, that's at least how it works with, with neutrons. And the question of neutrinos is, is, more com is more complex, which we'll come to. Okay, we're not going to talk any, any more about neutrinos in this lecture. Blah, blah, blah. everywhere on Earth, in our, so in our solar system, we've looked in our galaxy, we've looked outside our galaxy, we've seen colliding galaxies even, and, that, and we don't see any antimatter. So you might say, okay, no antimatter. But <clears throat> let's think about that for a minute, what that means. You um, have heard about cosmology. Not to be confused with cosmetology, two different fields. Um, uh, in cosmology, there's something called Big Bang cosmology. Big Bang. Someone tell me what the Big Bang. What's the Big Bang? It's big. It's big. <laughs> or small. Do it again. Somebody tell me about the Big Bang. What does that mean? What does that idea mean? Go. Well, it's like a super dense kind of particle packet thing that just and it just waves in the universe. Well, it didn't really explode. It didn't make a really big of a bang. Well, we think that our universe came from a, a very hot and dense early stage about 14 billion years ago next Tuesday. We think the universe was created. Okay. The, um, and sometimes people say, well, what that means is, is that the universe was small. It started small. And then it got big. But of course, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's not like you can stand outside the universe and look at it and say, oh, you're a small universe. And I'm standing outside and looking at it. You know, when, 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 when you think about the Big Bang, don't think, oh, the Big Bang is here and it's growing and this is going to blow up into a universe. I can stand outside and look at it. You cannot stand outside your universe and look at it, right? So the way to think about a Big Bang is that <clears throat> not that the universe was small, but that it was hot. It was very hot. And, and it was so hot, and this is our idea, which is supported by many, many measurements, which we'll come to, that we think that if we run the clock backwards, that about 14 billion years ago, the universe was very, very hot. And it was so hot that uh, protons and antiprotons were in thermal equilibrium. What is, and what that means is that, uh, you know, if you ever boil soup on a stove, you look at it and all those vegetables are you know, cruising around in there and going in circles and stuff, so that everything is mixing up in that soup. So what thermal equilibrium means is that everything is balanced out and averaged. So the, our picture of the early universe is that in the very, very, very early times, the temperature was so high that protons and antiprotons would collide, make, make photons. The photons would then split apart and make antiprotons and protons, electrons, <coughs> positrons would find each other and annihilate, make photons, and photons would then split it back and forth, and it was, everything was mixed up. It was an equilibrium. But that's, you can see that we're starting to get into trouble because we, we talked earlier about one of the rules of matter and antimatter going into energy is that you have to conserve electric charge. That you have to, when this reaction goes of a photon going into a proton and an antiproton, the photon cannot go to a proton and a proton. It cannot go to an antiproton and an antiproton. It's got to go to a balance of a proton and an antiproton. So in the early universe, Big Bang cosmology, um, Big Bang cosmology, the idea is, is that you make just as much matter as antimatter in the early universe. It's so hot that energy is going into matter and antimatter, matter and antimatter is going into energy. Um, you make just as much protons and antiprotons. That's the basic idea of Big Bang cosmology. Um, so that's, um, you might think, gee, is, is that, uh, if you believe in the Big Bang, is it then possible to not have any protons or antiprotons at all? Um, and the answer is no, in, in, in the sense that um, 
as the universe cools off, and I'm going to avoid saying growing in size, because that doesn't make a lot of sense um, without some mathematical tools, but as the universe cools off, um, they, uh, it cools off to the point where a proton cannot find an antiproton to annihilate, <coughs> and the matter freezes out, that the, soup, the, the temperature of the stove is cooling off, so things sort of settle down, and they're not moving around, and the proton cannot find an antiproton to annihilate, and it freezes out. So the, the, the Kip Thorne's the big chill. The big chill, yes, the big chill. Yes, the big chill. We'll talk a bit, bit more about that. Um, is any, I mean, you guys have must have been to a skating rink. Yeah, been to a skating rink? Did you have a question or have you been to a skating rink? Okay, so if you've all been, or many of you have been to a skating rink. So if you go there on a Friday, Friday night, Saturday night, it's crazy. You, there's a lot of people. If you're like me, you can't skate. There's people like me, you see, they'll fall down. Um, and there's people bumping into each other all the time. And, and you get a lot of collisions going on. So the early universe is like going to a skating rink on a Saturday. What happens if you go to a skating rink on a Tuesday? <laughs> you look like a loser. <laughs> yeah. Um, you still fall. I mean, you there's still no one fall, there. But there's no one to run right, into. Yeah. The, um, the universe has grown to such a size that it's like a Tuesday, and the chance of running into another skater is very small. So it's, um, the, the protons and antiprotons can coexist and, and not annihilate because they can't find each other. Protons are, one thing we know about protons is that they're tiny, they're very small. Are you okay? Um, they're very small, so the chance of them running into each other is, is small. So <clears throat> it is possible if you start with an equal amount of protons and, and antiprotons, it's possible to have to have um, <clears throat> matter still survive. Now, the, the prediction of the Big Bang, <coughs> there's, 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 there's two predictions of the Big Bang about matter and antimatter. One is that there should be just as much matter as antimatter, because we started with just as we started with equal amounts of matter and antimatter when the universe was very young. There should be just as much matter and antimatter now. So we don't see any antimatter. That's kind of kooky. Um, another problem with the, with, with the Big Bang is that we can measure the number of protons and photons in our universe. So what, that, what, what does that mean? We, what, what that means is that we can put a telescope, point it out into space, and we can count the number of hydrogen atoms. You know, we are on this planet, and we're enjoying the fact that we have a lot of a lot of atoms besides hydrogen and helium. There's a lot of steel and carbon and silicon, plastic, etc. But space is most. Our universe is mostly made out of hydrogen and helium, and uh, and we're fortunate to be in this little corner of the universe that has a little bit of other things. Um, so if you if you go look out into space, you can count the number of hydrogen atoms, and you can also put a radio telescope out in space and count the number of photons, and you can calculate that ratio um, just by by two measurements. Does anybody know what the density of uh, protons is in space? If you point, um, you know, not, not, not here, of course, but if you just point a telescope out in space, not pointing at a star, just the average density of our universe. This is a number, you know, you, you, you can't get an Illinois driver's license until you know this. So, um, <laughs> so the, uh, it's, it's, it's a scale about our universe that you should have in your head if, if, if you think about science. So what's the density of space in terms of matter in space? It's, it's how, many, how many atoms per cubic meter? Should we, maybe we, we can make a betting pool, maybe. It's one. Are you the, the, it's, it's easy to remember. There's one proton per cubic meter. This is about a meter. There's one proton per cubic meter is the average density of space. It's a number you should have in your head. Um, so we can count that. We can, we can count that, that density. We can count the number of photons. We could, then, we could then predict, based on Big Bang cosmology, that if matter and antimatter is in equal amounts and then they annihilate, we can predict the ratio of matter to photons. We can predict that from Big Bang cosmology, and we can measure it. It turns out that our measurement is 500 million times bigger than what it should be if the universe 
was in equal amounts of matter and antimatter that just found each other and annihilated, and there were mostly photons left. Big Bang cosmology predicts that the universe should be vastly dominated by photons and a tiny amount of matter. What we measure is that the universe is matter dominated. It has 500 million times as much uh, matter per photon as we expect. And you don't get any partial credit for being off by 500 million. I mean, that's a, that's a big mistake. So, um, so it's a, it is a huge surprise that, um, it's a huge surprise that our universe has no antimatter in it. And, and even worse, that, that, that we're matter dominated in the sense that, um, we have much more matter than we would expect um, just from Big Bang, simple Big Bang cosmology. So what that lets us think about, it makes us think about the question of what's the difference between matter and antimatter? Maybe antimatter was created originally and then it decayed or something, or, or maybe it's hiding somewhere. We don't think it's hiding somewhere, because we've looked everywhere in the universe, looked under everybody's rug, can't find any antimatter. Um, so there's something different between antimatter and matter that we don't understand. And the reasoning is that the Big Bang cosmology, which is so compelling in, in explaining everything else about the universe that we see, predicts that there should be equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And we've started to see what some of the differences are between matter and antimatter at this laboratory and others. And we're going to talk about, in the next lecture, in 12 minutes, we're going to talk about how we are starting to see that antimatter is different than matter and perhaps might give us a hint as to where the antimatter went away. Okay, so we have two minutes before questions before we have our break. And there'll be an opportunity for more questions later, but if you got something burning in your mind right now about antimatter or black holes or dark matter, yes, sir. Oh, it would be, certainly the asteroid would be eliminated, and there would be a tremendous, uh, depends on the size of the planet, but yeah, it would be bad. It would be, yeah, would yes, certainly. Like I mean, the amount of energy released would, 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 de would destabilize the planet. How about that for a euphemism? Um, yes, sir. Um, I don't know if you're going to talk about this in the next uh, half, but uh, the last week we learned that, like, dark matter makes up a lot more in the universe than the regular matter. Is that? No, dark matter does. Dark matter does. No, 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 no. Dark. There's a lot more dark matter in our universe than normal matter. Antimatter is is a tiny fraction of normal of normal matter. Dark matter is a fascinating topic that we're not going to touch on here um, because we don't really know anything about it. I'm, I'm going to get to you. Um, so uh, we're looking for it. We believe that it's there, but we haven't seen it yet. And, and I think at the end of the lecture, what, actually at the break, we can talk more about it. This is why we think it's here. Um, we can talk more about dark matter. But I want to get your question before we get to dark matter. Has there been any success in using uh, anti or annihilation reaction fuel? No, not really. Um, there's a reason for that. You know what it is? That's hard, for sure. But that's not the main reason. What's the main reason? Creating enough antimatter. Creating enough antimatter. When you put gas in your car, <coughs> you get it out of the ground. Okay? There, we, we, there's no antimatter mines. Um, we've looked everywhere. We don't see any antimatter. So we have to create it from energy. And then, which, as you know, C squared is not a small number. So, so the, the amount of energy that's required to make a certain amount, just even a respectable amount of antimatter is enormous, much more than we're able to have right now. So you will never, it, it'll never be the situation that antimatter is the, is the cure for an energy crisis or a source of energy for the planet because we don't have any antimatter to start with and we have to take energy. So, but what it could be used for is that if we, if we do solve our energy crisis on this planet and get a sufficiently energetic source of energy, then we can turn that into antimatter and then we can take that antimatter and, and make spacecraft. Okay, good. Okay, so what's going to happen is that at 10 o'clock on that clock there, we're going to start again. So you've got 8 minutes and 40 seconds to go do what you want. And then we can ask questions.